our next two speakers, Ruth McDavitt and Kelsey G. Ruth uh, is the chief executive of the Summer of Tech. Um, it's New Zealand's uh, longest running tech internship program, which not only connects emerging talent with opportunities, but also helps organisations maximise the investment uh, in their interns. And Kelsey, as I'm sure you're about to find out, is a real go-getter. She's in her honours year of a Bachelor of Design at Massey University. Um, and she's been the chief executive of her own business for five years. Um, she's passionate about human rights and she's been involved in a number of projects that advocate for gender equality, victims of sex trafficking and overall social well-being. So I thought, well, that's all great stuff, but what don't we know about Ruth and Kelsey? So I asked them, you know, what hobby or secret they might have, and I got an email back going, oh, you've completely thrown us. And I did wonder about that. But I'll let you into a secret. Ruth knows the difference between a snapper and an orange ruffie. She was a fishmonger in a previous life. And Kelsey was a pre-professional ballerina. So perhaps if we ask nightly, nicely, she may pirouette for us at the end of the presentation. So with some gra govis grace, would you join me in welcoming Ruth and Kelsey to the stage? They didn't warn us about the singing. opportunity is to be up here. This is the first time I've ever spoken at a conference, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm really humbled to be on, st on the same stage as some of my industry heroes. Um, so my name's Kelsey. I'm a fourth year Bachelor of Design Honours student up at Kokomassi, and I'm majoring in Visual Communication Design. Um, I'm here today firstly because I'm really passionate about designing for social change and exploring how design can be used in Hi, thank you. <laughs> High-level organisations to aid in solving those really big, complex social issues, as well as engaging our communities, especially our young people, and developing and actioning solutions towards such change. I'm also here today because of Ruth, who will introduce herself shortly, but basically I've been networking my way around Wellington for the past year and a half, and this year I took over running two design communities. The Design Kids, a globally loved organisation, and Banter and Brews, a club at Massey, both of which aim to help bridge the gap between students, graduates, and the creative industry. Ruth, however, managed to network her way to me after hearing about Banter and Brews from one of her Massey summer interns. We met up for coffee to talk about a collaboration between Banter and Summer of Tech, but pretty immediately, I think she managed to uncover my passion in designing for social change. So here we are, she's presented me with this awesome opportunity to share my passion with you all today. And I hope that from this talk, I can inspire you to think about the potential of digital products and services from a new digital age perspective. Kia ora koutou, is that gonna work? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Ruth, I run Summer of Tech, so we're a non-profit industry-led internship program and I've been connecting students and graduates with exciting tech careers in New Zealand for over 10 years. I'm here today because the theme of Govis this year really resonate, resonated with me. Um, I'm sick of all the attention that's being paid to bright, shiny, new innovation initiatives. Words like disruption um, are getting on my nerves. They're thrown around a lot, but I love the, the concept of evolution. Um, it's actually looking deeper into the issue. I do mentor a lot of startups and entrepreneurs, but I truly have been around long enough to appreciate that ideas and startups are really, really easy. It's staying up, scaling up, and delivering on stuff that's hard. So I'm passionate about the really unsexy end of the spectrum, which is taking a bright new idea but executing on it, delivering on it, getting the right people together to solve the big problems and the small ones. I believe that our differences and how we manage them are gonna, is gonna help us build a stronger, better future. And the evolution is a way better sustainable uh, framework to think about than disruption. 
So in my work, um, I do connect bright, fresh-thinking students and graduates with local organisations that are open to evolving. Um, I'm supporting new ventures into being uh, with a strong bias towards social impact outcomes. I've also been an advisor on digital skills and tech qualifications. As an English literature major, my mother is extremely proud that I'm an, I'm an advisor to the Victoria School of Engineering. <laughs> I love the blend of wisdom and naivety, old thinking, new thinking, different thinking, dialogue, experimentation, and iteration. I think that that is gonna be key to building effective teams and delivering impact in our fast evolving world. And so over the course of this talk, Ruth and I are going to ping pong between each other across four key ideas. Four Ps are kind of like marketing mix strategy, if you will, to answering our how might we question. Um, we'll have a Q&A, so feel free to tweet us or slide all your questions through. And I'm going to kick off with our first P, purpose. So in my 21 years, I've grown up experiencing the leadership of not one, but two incredible female prime ministers. I've learned and appreciated, well, I've learned to appreciate the language of te reo and te ao Māori throughout my education. Recognising, fighting for and actioning steps towards climate change and a more sustainable planet. I've witnessed the legalisation of gay marriage and the acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community. And my favourite, I've taken part in the growth of feminism, female power and pushes towards gender equality. Most recently though, I've been witnessing young people triumph in our own parliament. Young people fighting for equal rights in education around the world. But more importantly, I've witnessed the young people who stand beside me in day-to-day -day life use their voices and actions to speak up and advocate for the issues that we really care about. Recently, I've come to realise that we're a generation who aren't waiting around for legislation to change things first. We are the ones taking charge in the areas that we believe need improvement and then urging our leaders to change it for good. We are a generation who are taking the reins on society and leading it to a place which we see fit for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to live in. Thank you. <laughs> so where did my journey begin? Now part of me wishes I could say that I woke up one morning and thought, you know what, today I'm just gonna go out there and save the world. But realistically, I'm not a superhero. And much like anything, it's been a really massive journey to get to where I am today. And I know that even this is only the start of a really great hikoi ahead of me. My first experiences tr trying to save the world actually came from my love of animals. I was about four or five years old when I first learned about the endangered species list, and in particular, the status of the giant pandas. I remember stubbornly asking my mother two questions. Firstly, why were all these animals dying? Secondly, what can I do to help? The second question, what can I do to help, is something that has stuck with me throughout this journey and become something of the values that I uphold in my day-to-day -day life. Throughout my primary education at Enviro School, this question was well nurtured. I was shown more and more ways that my own small actions could have an impact on much bigger things. And it was here where my passion to help maintain a sustainable environment for our future generations really grew. Throughout high school, I became more socially aware the studies of English literature and design, coupled with the growth of social media culture, allowed me to gain more of an understanding of the world around me. And so the question of what can I do to help extended from animal and environmental welfare to our own kind and our welfare. Continuing to my tertiary study, the solutions to this question grew into bigger, more real and more tangible things. I came to recognise a position of privilege in myself. Whilst all these experiences have given me a wealth of self-awareness and knowledge, I began to see that there are many others in our society who do not know that these opportunities to learn, strive and be heard exist. So what have I done? As a communication designer, I have it in my toolkit to be able to facilitate learning, persuade opinions, emotionally engage an audience through visuals and experiences. And if you amalgamate these interactions with the goal to educate people on the opportunities available to them to learn, strive and be heard, you'll find yourself standing much where I am today. And I'm lucky to have had the luxury of being able to choose which work I dedicate my time and energy towards. And a lot of the work I have undertaken, whether that is with a university project, a freelance project, or work in the industry, has somewhat been in the sphere of environmental or social welfare. And I want to introduce you to a couple of these. Te Kotare stemmed from a university paper, 
where students teamed up, we selected our, a real client from a pool of several clients with real briefs. We were tasked to work competitively against other teams in order to win over our selected client with our design solutions. Te Kotare is a legacy project in remembrance of the late Jenny Shearer, a local early childhood educator who had written 10 beautiful waiata, which she used to teach her classes. The project was brought to us COCA students by her husband, three sons, and a close family friend. When it was pitched as just a brief for just a CD cover and a lyric book, I immediately thought, no, hang on a second. This is a huge opportunity to make a massive impact on the future generations and the future of Te Reo. We can do so much more. And so we did. Working alongside my best friend, Alicia, we pulled together a team of 18 students and project led our group to complete not only a CD cover, but a resource package that consisted of an A3 songbook complete with translations, illustrations, and chords, a teacher's guidebook with lyrics, chord charts, guidelines to pronunciation, and appropriate teaching methods, motion graphic lyric videos to each of the songs so children could continue to access these resources from home, a corporate identity, an immersive space marketing campaign, and a strategic release plan. I'm really happy to say that I'm still working on this project today. In March, we reached our $20,000 funding goal on Pledge Me, where early childhood centres and primary schools from around the country were nominated to receive a full resource package. We're currently in the midst of finalising all of our designs and working with publishers to get these resources printed. We aim to be releasing them with the start of the 2019 school year. It's also just been picked up by a rather large agency who I can't say the name of yet, but it's pretty exciting. Um, Cool. So another one is the squeeze. This project was created in just three hours alongside one of my best friends for the 2017 Adobe Creative Jam competition. The brief was to design a hypothetical product that engages and encourages youth aged 18 to 23 to enroll to vote for what was at the time the upcoming general election. The squeeze is an app that aims to inform young people on all the juicy details for each general election as well as provide and facilitate provide a space to facilitate an effortless enrolment to vote. By presenting hefty information on policies in a quirky way that is easy for young people to understand and relate to, we would have been able to empower these young people to take action, speak up, and vote with an educated and well-informed opinion. This aimed to eliminate any, oh, I'll just vote for this party because that's who my parents are voting for, and enable young people to really feel like the vote that they cast stood for something that they truly cared about. How cool is that? So my purpose is... <laughs> my purpose is unleashing the digital generation, and I feel like just getting Kelsey on stage to talk to you, my, my, my work here is done. Um, what I'm really passionate about is helping society, helping organisations embrace the change that's coming, the energy that's already here, um, to support emerging talented people to contribute to building the world that they want to live in. If Kelsey and her mate can do that in three hours, we're doing okay. So the future is here, it's also not evenly distributed. Many of the institutions and the conventions we're holding on to are standing in the way rather than supporting the evolution. The only certainty we have is that change will continue to happen. It's time that we get out of the way or perhaps lean in, metaphor problem. Um, we just need to open the doors as well to evolve our thinking and our strategizing and our actions to step into the, what is probably going to be uncomfortable to get stuff done, and for all of our skills and experiences to contribute to the evolution. My message to the older generations who might be resisting the change is that the kids today are doing okay. The future leaders are emerging, they're, they're more where these guys came from. As you've heard from Kelsey already, the purpose and the passion is really strong. The opportunity that we've all got now is to create the right environment to recognise the great ideas that are coming through, to listen, and to adapt and implement faster. So are we really ready? What I want to do today is show you some pathways to becoming more ready and how to open your doors to more people to help with the digital evolution. 
So if Emma, Chloe, and Sam have shown their passion, their purpose, they've also had to have a huge amount of persistence. Because there are many more amazingly talented people coming through right now, we need to actively seek out this kind of fresh thinking and be ready to adopt it. Finding out who else is doing amazing work quietly at the edges and embrace their approach into the mainstream. So in this room, we have incredible resource and opportunity to unleash the adaptive, the creative problem solving that is going to enable the evolution of our organizations. I'm going to share in between Kelsey's um, presentation bits some tools, some processes, some approaches that may hopefully help you support the great unleashing within your existing structures, not overlooking the wisdom of experience, the systems that you're working within, um, and the things that are already in place delivering great products and services to the people of New Zealand. The slide is about minding the gap. So I hear a lot in the media and from people that I'm talking to that we have a massive talent shortage, we have a skills gap, especially in tech. What's going on? I completely disagree. We have got an oversupply of fantastically talented people. They're coming through our education systems or they're in a different career. We have a massive shortage of opportunity to bring entry-level people in and train them up. Trust me. They can be highly valuable extremely quickly. We have no tech talent shortage in New Zealand. On the other hand, we've heard, uh, those of us who were at breakfast this morning, um, heard a, I heard a very freaky thing from Ryan. So on the one hand, he was talking about there's one million cybersecurity vacancies in the world and it's growing. On the other hand, he was talking about the automation of penetration testing and the facts that those highly paid highly skilled jobs are going to be extinct very soon. These mixed messages that are coming through to kids is actually putting them off sticking with STEM subjects because they're here and there's a lot of people choosing not to study computer science and engineering because automation. We need to get our story straight. So my message is that we do not have a pipeline problem. We have a problem with the education system, the messages that, get, that are getting through to people as they're coming through my, my pyramid metaphor. Um, and we have a shortage of entry level opportunities. If everybody is wanting to hire seniors and nobody's taking responsibility for growing them, we have an entirely unsustainable thing and we're never going to leap that gap in the pyramid. I get told every day that we can't possibly hire a junior or an intern or a graduate because they need too much training, we're too busy, um, we're going on holiday, we have a brownout, they're not useful, I get a gazillion, a gazillion excuses. Um, Aotearoa, we have a problem. Um, it's not a sustainable industry. Our best and brightest are looking overseas, they're looking outside of tech for opportunities if we're not welcoming them in at the bottom of the pyramid. And that's just the ones that are coming through our education system. If you look outside of that, self-taught, people languishing in other careers who are looking to move, they've got amazing transferable skills. So there's no pipeline problem, people. There is a retention problem. Um, and so particularly um, for women, for Māori, for Pacifica, um, sticking in STEM education and sticking in tech careers. Okay, problem, problem, problem. How are we gonna bridge the gap? Kelsey's done an awesome job on the slides, hey? <laughs> so bridging this perceived gap and helping to us to get peak, peak pyramid performance. Firstly, we need a mindset shift. So if, if you think young people these days don't have motivation, um, you know, they don't have the right purpose, actually it's probably because they're not connected, they don't understand. They're not participating in the conversations about the problems we're trying to solve. The opportunities are really well hidden. If they're attached to people we know, people who are coming through with straight A's, achieving in the traditional, um, in the traditional pathways, we're not actually gonna solve new problems. So helping people connect and evolve the way they work um, on the top of the pyramid to bring through the fresh talent is one of my core purposes. If you think about Kelsey's project, Te Kotare, as a potential to evolve how early childhood um, Māori language education works, 
boom, that's pretty exciting. If the squeeze can be built in three hours and deployed really quickly to help with voter engagement, that's pretty cool. It doesn't take much to channel these ideas and deploy them into your existing structure and systems. So on the left of the pyramid, equipping more young people with the resources, skills, and more importantly, the opportunities to bring them closer to making a difference. And on the right-hand side of the pyramid is evolving our institutions, our organizations, to reach back and bring them closer. Training for skill, providing opportunities to gain experience fast is key. The technologies and tools that we're using are changing faster than our 18th century education system can cope with we need to rethink what, what fresh talent looks like. Chances are your future peak performers will not resemble you at that age and that career stage. So if we move faster to close the talent and opportunity gap, engaging a broader foundation, that's people of different ages, stages, backgrounds and perspectives, we can ultimately build a taller, more effective and structurally sound pyramid of talent. Um, as I'm sure you could tell from listening to Kelsey, this, um, this generation is all about the purpose. So the millennial meh is a myth. This represents a massive opportunity for public sector employers. Um, aligning your social impact, your service delivery, will attract the best and brightest fresh talent to your teams. You've got to want it, be ready for it, communicate the opportunities and pathways, but there's a fantastic way to bring in fresh ideas into your organizations. I'll be talking a little bit about how you can promote, attract, hire, train, retain, and unleash the talent and perspectives onto your teams. This will make your teams stronger and help you deliver better, more resilient digital products and services. So the key, one thing to know, aligning your purpose and passion with theirs. Not rocket science, not hard to do. Cool, so our second P is process, and it's about adding the hows to our whys. I wanna just quickly talk about a couple of personal case studies. So over the past year, I've been interning and working in junior positions around the Wellington industry. I found that I've had a contrasting range of jobs, but again, all of which have managed to be in the social good or change sphere, which is really cool. Um, this time last year, I just started interning at Scouts New Zealand, where I ended up in a junior role for nine months. Uh, working on their annual report for 2017. During my time here, staff made sure that I had the chance to really immerse myself in the Scouts New Zealand experience, something that I didn't have when I was a child. Um, I got to attend the National Photography School, a conference on youth development, a campfire night, a visit to a local Sea Scout group, and I met Scouts from all ages from all over the country. It was really cool. I got to learn from the end users about the things that I was designing for. Over the summer, I balanced this job with, part -time, with a part-time internship at Allen & Clark. They're a local policy and regulatory agency. And this job really opened my eyes up to how our government works. For example, I actually had no idea that agencies wrote policy papers for our governments. And I thought that the actual like, leaders, like Jacinda, wrote the policy papers herself. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so one thing that I wish about this particular experience is that I wish I had had more time in this job to learn exactly what it was that they did and understand it from the core. Um, and using these two experiences to compare them to one another, I've learned about the importance of understanding not only the work that the company does, who their external and internal clients are and what they needed, but also who their clients' clients were and what they needed too. I've been able to see that empathy is key in designing successful products and services. For me, I felt like my time at Scouts was a more successful experience because they knew that in order for their staff to do the best work they could do, they had to immerse their staff in the Scouts experience so that they got it from a first-hand perspective, what their work was setting out to achieve. It's not to say that Alan and Clark weren't empathetic in their work. They really were, and they do some impressive work too. It's just that I wasn't involved in the process as much, so I wasn't able to wholly grasp what I was trying to be empathetic about or designed for. In the third year of Coca Massey's Bachelor of Design course, we're taught design thinking. I don't doubt that many of you in this room are familiar with this phrase. For those of you that aren't, there's five key steps. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. 
This process is a bit like building a house. You need to have the foundations before you can do anything else, otherwise naturally the house is gonna fall apart. I also tend to see it as a bit like running a race. And if you don't start off on the right foot, you're going to trip yourself up and you're gonna to scramble to pick yourself up to complete it. Empathy is the foundations of the house or the right foot to push off from. And I found that in order to empathize as successfully as possible, there's two things that you need to do. The first is work directly with the end user to dissolve, and the second is dissolve any socioeconomic barriers that there might be. And I say as successfully as possible here, is we have to understand that we're never going to be able to exactly see the world from someone else's point of view. And we'll never exactly understand their situation unless we've been through it ourselves. However, we don't need to be superheroes who understand everything. We just need to be self-aware. For example, when designing for the big social issues that I love to tackle, I first and foremost need to recognize my own position of privilege, which is an educated, financially comfortable member of society. And this is followed by any socioeconomic barriers which I may face. For example, my gender, my age, occupation as a student, and my ethnicity. But by recognizing my own privilege and my own barriers, I'm able to recognize that the end users I'm designing for might have differing points of positioning in society and differing things that challenge them in their day-to-day -day lives. So by empathizing, not only do I think about the barriers, but I think about how are we gonna turn these barriers around and turn them into strengths to work with. But I also need to be aware that these problems I'm trying to create solutions for are often, com are often intricately and com complex issues. Therefore, their solutions should not be developed in ignorance. And I can't save the world, but I can change it just for a little bit for the better. I want to jump down to the fourth and fifth steps of the design thinking process, prototype and test. Again, much like building a house, you can't just lay the foundations and then build the house next to the foundations. It just doesn't work. So consequently, with design, you can't just empathize and not continue to design with the end user. Throughout all of the design thinking process, it's important to involve the end user. In the stages of prototyping and testing, it is vital to the success of the final product that the end user is involved in these stages. Why? Because they're the ones who are going to be using it. It needs to work for them. These stages are a chance to quickly test ideas, make the cliched and the ridiculous shit, find out what works and what doesn't, Observe how your end users react to the solutions. How do they feel? How do they interact with it? Does it actually work for them? If it doesn't, what are you gonna do about it? Let them ask you the simplest of questions and let yourself see if you have an answer for it too. By involving the end user in this part of the process, you're not only gaining first-hand insight into what the product or service needs to be like, but you're also facilitating the empowerment of the end user. And acknowledging, and acknowledging their importance in the process and recognizing that their opinions matter to the success of the product or service, the end users are not only more likely to use the product or service, but they're going to enjoy using it too. My message for process is make sure it's not standing in the way of your people executing. It could be actually holding you back. I do feel like I'm speaking to a room, a preaching to the choir, you're already doing this stuff, but I'm quickly going to talk about re-engineering your processes. Many of you are on a journey to, I learned a new acronym, acronym, ALDO, Agile Lean DevOps. I'm sure you've got service design happening up the wazoo, and you may be slowly or quickly, painfully or easily evolving away from legacy systems, embracing the cloud, maybe some more than others. I get the challenge of ensuring that your systems remain reliable, secure, stable, and available, and the pressure at the same time to move faster, be more open, be transparent, digitize, iterate, develop, deliver more with less, um, yeah, and keep the minister off the front page, thanks. If digital transformation is being thrust upon you, um, then you may have a problem. If leaders and teams don't understand the why, you have a really big problem. The evolution won't, won't happen without change in mindset and acceptance that the processes need to change and they will continue to change and it will continue to be uncomfortable. It's fundamentally not, by the way, about delivering everything online. 
Uh, the answer to everything is not to build another website. Um, we've got enough of those, thank you. Um, I wasn't here yesterday, but I, he I hear there was a magical demonstration of a concierge service that just solved all that problem. So unified is awesome. If we're looking under the bonnet of the website, um, figuring out how it can become, the actual delivery of what you're trying to do can become more resilient, responsive, and fit for purpose. You're going to need the right processes and you're going to need different tools from yesterday. One of the nice things about the phrase of digital evolution is the emphasis on the journey. Unlike disruption, which implies some kind of utopia at the end of a change rainbow, which in my experience has never happened. So if we accept that we're, on, we're, on a, we're evolving, we're on a journey, the decision to become a learning organization that embraces new thinking is actually quite easy. When, once you've created an environment that's safe for new ideas, it's okay to fail as long as you fail fast and learn and don't make, repeat that same mistake. That's pretty cool. So fresh thinking will lead to a little bit of chaos. It will be a little bit freaky. But at the end of the day, the processes will enable your products and services to be more resilient, responsive, and fit for purpose. So Kelsey has comprehensively covered empathy, design thinking, service design, very essential tools for building better products and services. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the leadership management practices um, to help you get the, get the best um, out of your people and actually harness the fresh forward thinking um, in a not too freaky way, just so that your processes support rather than get in the way of delivery. The first one's not easy, it's about mindset. Um, so shifting the way that you think, the way that you hire, the way that you run your teams um, is, is really hard. If you're nervous about hiring millennials, if you have teenagers in your life who freak you out on a daily basis, it can be quite unnerving. But the key to being open about generational diversity and fresh thinking is cutting through the hype. For the next generation, the expectation of employment and career paths and what you do in your day job is actually quite different to what it was in the past. Um, some people freak out about hiring millennials because their office isn't quite right. You know, we need to have beer o'clock, bean bags, and foosball tables. I hear this a lot. It's so untrue. Um, you don't actually need gimmicks to com compete with the Silicon Valley wannabe tech companies who are also trying to hire the top digital talent because that is not the reason they will take the role. What you do need is a supportive work environment, a very clear and aligned purpose and passion, and the ability to communicate a clear understanding of how their work is making a difference. If it's getting tangled up in bureaucracy and decision making, those bright people are not gonna stick around. Small agile teams are what students today are used to, that's what they expect. If your teams don't have clear goals, the right tools, and the trust to get stuff done, um, then the millennials will not stick around. As you're walking around your floors, if you look at a meeting room with more than three people in it, have a little bit of a think about how much work they're actually going to get done. Oh, that's a bit freaky. Small, agile teams um, empowered, trusted to get stuff done. So your processes from hiring, your organization chart, your team KPIs, the individual responsibilities, everything that is structured around your people needs to be clear and aligned to purpose and delivery. Once you've sorted out the why, give the people the tools to execute. There's a really interesting piece of research from Google who have analyzed, trust me, all the data on what makes a high performing team. So it's not IQ, it's not experience, it's not grades, it's not qualifications. The answer, filtered down and translated into normal human speak, is EQ, empathy, communication skills, especially listening and asking good questions. And this is across all types of teams globally. Teams that collaborate well will get more stuff done more effectively than teams with high IQ, impressive job titles, and high pay, and years of experience. Google says it, it must be true. Um, the thing about evolving is that it must involve failure, it must involve trying new things and failing. It's okay as long as you learn from it. 
So in order to get a faster evolution of your business processes, the try, fail, learn, succeed cycle needs to happen faster. Embracing the right tools, the right processes to enable you to identify and engage with the right people, support them properly, and unleash them in a beautiful way. This is my chaos monkey. Um, the mindset shift and the change is going to hurt. Um, at the risk of sounding like an author, bestseller, maybe, this could be the time for everyone to lean in to visit discomfort. So let, letting go of the stuff that's slowing you down. If you're in the public service, asking the public what needs to change is a really good starting point. They have opinions. Um, your people also have opinions. If you ask the people who've been working with you for more than 10 years, they know exactly what needs to change right now. Ask the people who've just joined you, been working with you for the last year, they'll know what bits of your process are slowing them down. Once you know that, that's the next step. Prioritization, iterating, fixing, prototype testing, and doing all that faster. So I spent more than 10 years working in the public service, and I would feel most of the time like I was in a very slow-moving container ship. <laughs> if that's what your job feels like, <laughs> you need to know that a container ship is old infrastructure. The technology for self-driving, what was it, flying cars, drones, de de delivering your customized user-tailored parcel to a GPS coordinate, that's what the public is expecting you to be moving towards. The freaky thing is that after I left New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, 18 months later I went back and it was a completely different organisation. Things just worked. I had to present to the team, I plugged the thing in, they did the magical hangout thing and it just worked. I talked to my former colleagues and they weren't bitching and moaning about the stuff that wasn't working anymore. Trust me, they were bitching and moaning about other things. But the technology barriers that I'd, that I'd felt, it was eight years I was there, slowing me down, the reason I left, had all been fixed. It's possible to do it really fast. Um, have I got another slide? I do, yeah. This is um, another lesson from, from NZTE. I know that other organisations are, are successfully clouding all the things, and I just want to let you know that it hasn't been terrible. Um, it has actually led to reduced risk, improved security, accessibility, and massive savings. Um, so this is not me doing a pitch for the cloud, but if you're holding back, if you've got people clinging to Windows XP, if you're band-aiding 20-year-old products, you've got a problem. Um, twice this week, I've been asked if we have any COBOL developer interns. <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, there is a university in India, <laughs> but and I'm sure they're charging a premium. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's not a sustainable pipeline, people. This is my version of Richard's flying car. The future that I was promised involved hoverboards that actually hovered like above the ground. Um, still not happening, as far as I can tell. My message here is that it's not actually about the tech. The tech's going to change, and it may not be what we expected. It's a delivery mechanism. Thinking about digital products or services that are working well, we focus most of the time on stuff that's not working. We notice when things are broken. Um, the challenge is that when you fix something, you're unlikely to get a ticker tape parade because things are fixed, so people won't notice. So you'll, they'll just complain about the next thing. So the challenge for you as, as people managers, as, as team members, is to measure the impact that you're having, the absence of friction. Celebrate internally with your team because the impact of stuff that just works is huge. Nearly there. Um, other sort of innovation productivity killers do include red tape. Um, here's a quote. Policy is educated guesswork with a feedback loop measured in years. So that one's from Tom Loosemore, who was formerly of the UK's government digital service. My message here is that the, the slow pace of decision making and change is killing innovation, the hierarchy, the risk aversion, the outdated processes are getting in the way of, of evolution and growth. You'll also at the same time lose your best people um, if you have all this red tape floating around. And the smart young people, word of mouth is really strong. They will stay away. 
Quick note about horizons. Now, I loved Richard talking about the thousand-year plan. Like, bring it on. Most Western democracies suffer from a three-year-ish uh, cycle, um, which is actually another evolution killer. Here's a question for you. What is the ratio of contract to permanent staff? That is another challenge. If you've got people who are in and out really fast, you're not necessarily going to be getting the most out of them. Contracting processes are not agile. They're relying on a traditional waterfall mindset. There is no wiggle room. There's no space to iterate, to respond, to learn, to change. If learning and knowledge don't accrue inside your organization, the end of the contract, it walks out the door. And then you have to pay more for it next time. I'm not saying don't bring in experts to help you solve big problems, but I am saying that the learning, development, and growth of your people is your biggest asset. Short-term thinking about how people capability, resourcing is, is managed um, is going to lead to teams with ne less connection and less to your purpose and le less ability to deliver. So to become a learning and evolving organization, you need to hire at all levels and ensure you have career development plans, pathways to retain, grow, and maximize the skills of your people. Nearly there. Um, some next level people investment and retention strategies is to get inclusion right, then hire for diversity. I mentioned we have a retention problem. There is no point in hiring a diverse team if you're not going to look after them properly. So diversity, when you're ready for it, is generational, it's mindset, it's background, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, experience, and more. Another next level thing I'd love to see more of in the public service helping with retention is exchanges and secondments. There's been a lot of talk the last couple of days about collaboration. This is next level. Send your people out, bring them back. They will, they will share good stuff and then they'll come back and bring, bring the good stuff back. And they might discover how awesome you are after all and they'll stick around longer. I mentioned inclusion briefly, but I just wanted to reiterate it here. Your processes need to run deep. They need to recognize that your people and your knowledge are your biggest taonga, your biggest treasure. So if you're stuck in short-term thinking, if your best and brightest people are not sticking around, you're in constant strategy and innovation meetings, you've got lots of post-it notes on the walls, but nothing's happening then you're probably in the state of tokenism. You're doing it because post-it notes, right? Whiteboards, bring it on. It's not actually translating into delivery. So if you treat your people and the service that you're undertaking as a taonga, it won't be about ticking boxes and PR coverage. The stuff that matters will go way deeper and will have a longer term impact um, than the next election cycle. I want to talk really quickly about one example of inspiration, which I think is a particularly successful as a digital product and service. And it engages young people in understanding government and educates them on the, so the scale of social issues in New Zealand, as well as facilitating the recognition of the, the impact of their voice. On the Fence was designed by Koka Massey's Design and Democracy team in collaboration with local design studio Spring Load. It was first conceptualized in 2014 to help young first-time voters engage directly with social issues and aid in informing them which political party aligned with their personal values. This enabled these first-time voters to make a more informed decision when voting in the 2014 general election. On the Fence returned again last year for the 2017 general election in an updated version and was one of the tools that I saw many young people utilizing turning towards and recommending when they weren't sure who to vote for. For many of my friends, last year's general election was the first time they had thought about voting. And this was due to them not knowing who to vote for in 2014, therefore simply just not voting. I remember using On The Fence to help convince a lot of my friends to vote. It's a really visual, non-stressful and non-daunting tool that helped us figure out what we really cared about and to what degree Plus, it broke down all of the hefty words that young people don't think apply to our lives. A lot of the reactions I remember my friends saying consisted of, oh, I never thought that I would be for or against this party, and wow, this party doesn't actually care about this issue. 
My friends were really baffled about who they thought they aligned with and didn't actually resonate with who they, what they stood for. And it was really empowering to see my friends go from, nah, I'm not gonna vote, to yeah, let's vote. What else do I need to do? And then finally, hey, check it out, I just went to vote. Right now, I personally would like to see, whoops, I personally would like to see more successfully designed digital products and services that are capable of facilitating this empowerment within young people. I believe that there is huge potential for positive socioeconomic growth if more young members of society were involved and enthused by government processes. But what is it that we need? Is it more external agencies? Is it more experience and service design teams in our ministries? Or is it simply youth voices and fresh thinking across these agencies and teams? Let's talk about products with consideration to our purposes and our processes. Where do we see ourselves and our work going? And how might we use this path to influence more digital products and services along the way? The end product I, sorry, the end product I envision for myself is working in government, alongside many of you, delivering citizen-centered and influenced solutions to social issues. This year, I've been focusing my, focusing my honors thesis project on facilitating children's empowerment through the activation of graphics within spaces. In particular, the space a child goes through when a member of their family enters our correction system. I've been looking at examples of VR, of VR and how it's been facilitated throughout healthcare to help improve children's empowerment there. But I wonder how the evolution of digital products and services might serve our young people today and in the future not just as civil engagement processes, but as a service in times of adversity to provide community strength whenever that may be. Yay. So my contribution to our products um, section is to share some examples, just a few, of digital products and services that I believe have embraced freaky, fresh thinking and are delivering something meaningful. I thought I'd start globally. Um, the circle diagram on the left is actually from the states, not that I'm holding them up as any kind of best practice of anything at the moment, but their user-centered, uh, user needs in the middle, wrapped around by digital service delivery, operations, and policy. It's an image from Code for America, which I think are doing an amazing job to mobilize people to the civic tech community to help and support digital government. They are having a voice, and the massive change up to a point of the change of government was pretty incredible over the past few years. So my other global example is Estonia, and I know there are many more examples, but I like Estonia as an example of a small country at the edge of Europe with massive economical and social def deficit punching well above its weight through digital transformation. Their e-residency program is particularly cool. You don't need to be physically in Estonia to be a vi virtual resident. Closer to home, I know Pia is here and the team are doing amazing stuff, the DIA service design team. It's a shout out to the Lab Plus team. They're solving big and small pro problems in a very agile and user-centric way. I love the work on open government, the move towards government as a platform. A couple of weeks ago, we worked with DIA on the govt.nz uh, website. So we ran a hackathon where we had 25 completely diverse individuals come in, students who wanted to get some experience hacking on a solution. We completely reimagined the gov.nz service um, and, and just were looking at how you can do a unified government service. So taking that concept of Kelsey, bringing the squeeze, build support from the DIA team, and we heard that they got deep insights just from a couple of days. Yay, DIA. Couple of other examples. This one's more looking at how we're getting around that sort of committees kill innovation. How do we accelerate and how do we apply lean thinking to unleashing cool stuff on the universe? So a couple of accelerator models that are spinning up some great digital products in a different format. Statistics New Zealand have launched Data Ventures, which is partnering with experts inside and outside statistics to create ventures to unleash government data to the world. Mahuki is Te Papa's accelerator for digital innovation in the gallery, library, arts and museum sector. They're already evolving some really incredible products. 
Millennials, privileged ones who have had a mobile phone since they were born and feel like bandwidth is one of the bottom rungs of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they want stuff now. They're used to it. They're the digital generation. They want the tech to be seamless and invisible, shouldn't stand in the way. There are a lot who are not accessing digital products and services. Always assume a low-tech user until we have no digital divide, which is not happening anytime soon, which is another reason to make sure that you've got the right people around the products that you're creating for them. We've heard that the devices will be obsolete in a couple of years, so it's not about the tech, although you actually need to ensure that the tech is working. The products and solutions that you're building today had better be future-proofed. They better be ready to adapt. Fundamentally, your key assets are your data, your knowledge, and your people. Everyone loves progress, but change is hard. If we're going to unleash the potential and embrace the digital evolution, we need to rethink some key parts of what we do, why we do it, and how. We've talked about purpose, product, and processes, but ultimately, the most important thing in the age of technology, automation, digital delivery, is the who. Who are we serving? Whose opinion are we taking into account? Who are we building it for? Who is doing the building? And are we asking them if we're delivering the right things in the right ways? It has to do with who holds a purpose and a drive to challenge the status quo. Who facilitates the processes to find solutions? And who the end product is ultimately for? We're talking about people. It's inevitable that in our world today, technology will constantly be evolving. As we journey along with this whirlwind of exciting advances, it's ever more important to remember Who's at the center of the product and service that you're designing? The technology does not matter because it will change. If you're building the latest chatbot, AI, automated delivery, virtual reality on the blockchain solution, it doesn't make a difference. Digital is like the printing press of our time. It's what we do with it and how our products reach the audience that really matters. Be, invo be involved be empathetic and be empowering. Understand the end user and what they need. Put yourself in their shoes and try to see the situation from their point of view. And then you let them take the reins on society. Empower your people to design and deliver. Make sure the machinery of today's product, FAD, doesn't get in the way of the purpose. We want to finish up by asking you three questions. We want you to think about 25 years from now. Think about the ideal society that you'd like your grandchildren to be growing up in. Fast forward another 25 years and think about the society that you'd like to be leaving behind for them. Our questions to you today, what does that society look like? What values does that society hold? And finally, what are you going to do to help get it there? He aha te mea nui o te ao. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. Inspired, inspired by you, Kelsey. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to go and find a whole bunch of graduates now. <laughs> uh, so can we have a look at the questions, please? I think there's at least time for one more. One question, what have we got up the top? When we live in an organisation that, by nature, block action, block action with processes, how can we create an environment to harness the passion of young people in the public service? Change the organisation. <laughs> If it's not changing fast enough, they'll change it for you, is my answer to that. Have you got anything? Um, I want to say I'd love to see government be a lot more open and transparent. I mean, considering myself coming into Allen and Clark and thinking that Jacinda wrote policy papers, you know, like, who else that is my age has that thought? I want to know how our government works. I want to be enthused about how our government works. So if you guys could show us that and lead us through that, that would be really, really cool. Another quick thing is that forgiveness, not permission. If you're in a position to make a small change internally, just do it. 
you know, then ask forgiveness because chances are that you'll have more support than you think. Obviously, you know, legislation, be, be good about that. But there's a lot that you can do at the edges. Trust me on that. So if we could show our appreciation for Kelsey and Ruth, please. And